today. The Olympic champion hoping to make a big splash at the Rio Games. The weight was off of my shoulders. David Budaya remembers winning the gold. That means I won. And finding out what's greater. It was no longer, look at me, I'm the best. And then, a three-year-old in pain. She would just come to me out of the blue and say my stomach's hurting. Is miraculously cured. She had just held it like that. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. The conventions are finally over, hallelujah. <laughs> and now the election campaign begins between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And this race could be a very nasty and a very close one for the White House. No doubt about that. Well, on the last night of the Democratic Convention, Clinton promoted herself as someone who is steady and tested in an uncertain world, while attacking Donald Trump as, Trump as unfit to be president. Jennifer Wishon brings us the story from Philadelphia. American flags waving, tears in the audience flowing, Hillary Clinton took a long victory walk. For her, this moment took a long time. For her supporters, they say, a woman's place is in the White House. Standing here as my mother's daughter and my daughter's mother, I'm so happy this day has come. I'm happy for grandmothers and little girls and everyone in between. I'm happy for boys and men, because when any barrier falls in America, it clears the way for everyone. After all, when there are no ceilings, the sky's the limit. The 68-year-old has been in public service for 40 years. In Philadelphia, for the first time, she got to introduce herself to the nation in a way like never before. The truth is, through all these years of public service, the service part has always come easier to me than the public part. Clinton worked to paint herself as a unifier in divided times, a tested leader who can handle the volatile world, and a policy wonk who knows how to get things done. She aggressively went after her Republican rival, Donald Trump, urging the nation not to fall for his sweeping promises. He's taken the Republican Party a long way from morning in America to midnight in America. He wants us to fear the future and fear each other. The line in her speech most tweeted was a man you can bait with a tweet is not a man we can trust with nuclear weapons. Donald Trump says, and this is a quote, I know more about ISIS than the generals do. No, Donald, you don't. In response, Trump tweeted, our way of life is under threat by radical Islam and Hillary Clinton isn't even bringing herself to say the words. He also spent the day on the stump fighting back. They're not talking about the real world, you know. They're not talking about radical Islamic terrorism. They're not talking about borders where people just pour across. They're not talking about the crime, the kind of crime that we have in this nation. They're not talking about the fact that many people in our country are making less money today in terms of real wages than they were making 18 years ago. They're not talking about that. Clinton also took on her other political foe, a divided Democratic Party. Bernie, your campaign inspired millions of Americans. In the audience, Sanders supporters protested her nomination, wearing glow-in-the-dark shirts, interrupting her multiple times. While the Clinton faithful shouted them down, she responded with an olive branch. Bernie Sanders and I will work together to make college tuition free for the middle class and debt free for all. And she explained how she'll pay for it. Wall Street, corporations, and the super rich are going to start paying their fair share of taxes. It was a night of girl power with Democrat women of the Senate taking turns explaining what Clinton has meant to them. She said, 
Decisions are being made every day in Washington. And if you are not part of those decisions and you don't like what they decide, you have no one to blame but yourself. Hillary believes that to her core. And the one Sanders supporters preferred over running mate Senator Tim Kaine gave Clinton a thumbs up. For 25 years, she's been on the receiving end of one attack after another. But she doesn't back down. She doesn't whine. She doesn't run to Twitter to give people's ugly nicknames. And she sure as heck doesn't quit. Chelsea Clinton introduced her mom, painting a personal portrait of the woman who always made time for her. I, I hope that my children will someday be as proud of me as I am of my mom. Hillary Clinton acknowledged some people don't know what to make of her. Millions of people watching at home have serious concerns about her character and trustworthiness. Now America is once again at a moment of reckoning. Powerful forces are threatening to pull us apart. Bonds of trust and respect are fraying. And just as with our founders, there are no guarantees. It truly is up to us. We have to decide whether we will all work together so we can all rise together. Now the stage is set. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump meet for the first of their three debates September 26th. Let the fireworks begin. Jennifer Wishon reporting from the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. I don't know if it's going to be fireworks or artillery. It seems to be <laughs> shaping up to be quite a slugfest. Well, our CBN News political correspondent, David Brody, he's with us now from Philadelphia. And David, who, who was the winner last night? It seemed like the crowd was really won over by Chelsea's Clinton speeches. Did, did she win over the, the Sanders delegates? Well, I think the fact that Chelsea Clinton started the speech out with talking about how her mom is a grandma, uh, you know, that started to soften her at the beginning. And I think that was uh, somewhat uh, jarring for a lot of folks, like, hmm, Hillary Clinton, grandma. Yeah, never quite put those two words together. And I, and I think that, that helps her, uh, for sure. Look, uh, Hillary Clinton's speech was uh, well-received. He's not Barack Obama. He's not Joe Biden. And, and quite frankly, uh, Tim Kaine uh, performed very well as well. So, I mean, Hillary Clinton, is who Hillary Clinton is and, and, and so that that's all she you can really hope for with her uh, I will say this though there were quite a few at least 10 to 12 or so we counted them tried to at least Bernie Sanders protesters uh, actually shouting out during their speech if you notice you heard a lot of Hillary chants Hillary Hillary they were drowning out the Bernie Sanders supporters so uh, there are no doubt uh, folks still out there very frustrated uh, with Hillary and they were wearing t-shirts that said enough is enough as a matter of fact those Hillary uh, signs that they were holding out, you know, a lot, or handing out a lot of those Bernie Sanders supporters were actually taking the Hillary uh, letters and changing it to liar. They would take the H-I and get rid of that and take the L and then the, they put the I and the A and the R together and make it liar. So, I mean, there's some unity work to be done, Gordon. Well, I was watching on TV. We didn't, we didn't see any of that on television. Uh, was, was that just hidden from the cameras? Yeah, I mean, you have to kind of go into the Twitter universe and, of course, be in the arena like we were last night, and you will see that. And, of course, the mainstream media isn't necessarily going to go out of their way to show what they will say uh, are just a smattering of, or, you know, just a handful of protesters that were doing that. And that is true. Uh, th there, w there weren't many, but there were uh, un enough to uh, make it a bit uncomfortable and, and make the message clear that Hillary Clinton has some work to do ahead of her. All right, well, I'm, I'm grateful the conventions are over, so let's turn to the general election. Well, what do you think are going to be the main themes uh, from both parties? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think what we've seen here, covering the Republicans, now covering the Democrats, look, uh, there are two ways you win the White House. One, you either win on optimism or you are the change candidate. And look what we have here. We have Hillary Clinton and the Democrats this week painting an optimistic picture of America and that she's the one that can get it done. And then you have Donald Trump coming in. The Democrats will call it doom and gloom. Trump will call it, hey, it's realistic America and basically say, I'm the change candidate. So 
you have a formula for success on the Republican side, the change candidate. You have a formula for success on the Democratic side, which is the optimism type candidate. And the question is, which one is going to win out? I will say this, that uh, I don't think there's any question about it that the momentum here is with Donald Trump. We have seen not only that bump in the polls that he got from the Republican National Convention, but if you start to look into the swing states, uh, he is now up in Florida. He is tied in Ohio. There are some other swing states out there. Uh, the, the point is, is that there have been two movements in this country, the Bernie Sanders movement, the Donald Trump silent majority movement. Hillary Clinton doesn't really necessarily have any sort of movement. She just has people going along with her because, well, she's been around for uh, quite a few decades. Well, if, if I were handicapping this race, uh, and I was uh, at the start of the year, I, I, I just thought Trump had an uphill battle. If, you, if you're not going to get women to vote for you, you're not going to get millennials to vote for you, you're not going to get Hispanics to vote for you, it's going to be tough to win the presidency. Uh, now it seems like there's this whole outsider movement, uh, and whether that's what happened in Great Britain with Brexit or what happened with Bernie Sanders or even what happened with Donald Trump and the Republican Party, there just seems to be we need somebody absolutely new to the political system. Uh, and that seems to be governing the, the day. Well, what's, what's your prediction on the key battleground states? Is, is Pennsylvania going to be a, a, up, up for grabs on this one? It is going to be up for grabs. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, some new polling has just come out this morning showing actually Hillary Clinton with na right now at least a nine point lead in Pennsylvania. That seems a bit high. It had been much closer before that. Uh, and as a matter of fact, in the next day or two, uh, Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine will be going into Pennsylvania for the next two days. Uh, Donald Trump will be out in Colorado. He'll spend time in Florida. Florida is going to be a huge swing state. Look, there are four. There's Florida, there's Ohio, uh, there's Pennsylvania, and I'm sure I'm forgetting another one because I'm working on a couple hours sleep. Uh, but no, th th there are key, oh, I think I said Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, uh, oh, and Virginia, that's the other one. Uh, and obviously Tim Kaine uh, clearly chosen at least one of the reasons that they're going to park him in Virginia where he's uh, relatively popular, obviously, as, as a former governor there. You know all about that, Gordon. I do, and uh, I actually predict they're going to not park him in Virginia. They're going to park him in Florida and have him give lots of speeches mm -hmm. in Spanish. So it, it, it may turn out to be yet another Florida election, which is all the way back to 2000. And hopefully we're not going to have any hanging chads and we're actually going to know who is elected president uh, at the close of this election. Uh, I, for one, will be very grateful when it's over. But David, you're going to be on the field uh, and you're going to be giving us wonderful reports. So thanks for being with us. And if you want to keep up with what David is doing on the campaign trail, he has this weekly program called The Brody File, and you can watch it at CBNNews.com. Wendy? You know, I always say David Brody makes politics fun. Yes, he does. <laughs> he really does. Very Great good. coverage from those guys. Well, up next, a prostitute is confronted by a neighbor with a bullhorn. I will get on the bullhorn and say, this is a no prostitution zone. The police will be called. And I'm standing out there with a Glock in my, you know, in my pants. And I'm like, you know, if you don't go back in your house, I'm out here. I'm high. I want, you know, I'm trying to work. <laughs> now the former prostitute calls her neighbor mom. Hear the rest of this remarkable story coming up. Well, in America, more than two million people are locked up in the criminal justice system, and some are calling that a crime in and of itself. And even though there's a big push for reform, the question remains, can inmates change and live crime-free once they're released? Well, John Jessup found a Florida rehab program with a near-perfect record. Take a look. God, our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, it is unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation. This is not your usual Bible study or weekly small group. Each day, these women pray together, read the Bible, and hold each other accountable, things they say they desperately need as convicted felons. We're not bad people, we've made bad choices. All they tell you is that you're never gonna make it. You're a convicted felon, you can't do it. It's gonna be terrible to get a job. Although women pose a lower public safety risk and their path to the criminal justice system often differs than men, the challenges they face upon release are often the same, like trying to find the support system they need to get back on their feet 
and fight for a second chance. Inside that door, Don Knighton is providing that support network by giving women a place to call home alongside others they come to know as family. This is our little kitchen. Cozy, you said. Yes, it is cozy. Mm -hmm. Christian counselor Don Knighton shares this small three-bedroom home with all these women. These are the ladies' rooms. We have four ladies to a bedroom. Her goal, helping female inmates released from prison have a place to live, find work. How was your day, Melanie? It was great. And become productive in society. Tough lessons for women with rap sheets that include grand theft, drugs, and even murder. For Dawn, this work is personal. I deserve to be on death row. I deserve to be doing life in prison. And only by the grace of God, you know, did he have another plan for my life. Dawn's life of crime began with drugs. She would eventually sell her body to feed a crack cocaine addiction. Before I knew it, I was homeless and, you know, living a life just doing things I never dreamed I would do, having just absolutely no morals and doing everything I could just to survive. You used to sleep here every night? Yes. She showed us where she slept, on the beach under these stairs. By day, she worked this street corner, harassed by habits she couldn't kick, and Christian neighbors who knew what she was up to. And I got my bullhorn out, and I would get on the bullhorn and say, this is a no prostitution zone. The police will be called. And I'm standing out there with a Glock in my, you know, in my pants, and I'm like, you know, if you don't go back in your house, I'm out here, I'm high, I, you know, I'm trying to work, and we'd go back and forth. That was really my first encounter with Dawn, but I didn't know Dawn personally, but I know I was praying for Dawn and a number of others like her. A total of close to 50 felony convictions finally caught up with her. It was during her last prison sentence, confined in a cell with only a Bible, that she says she experienced a radical change. And I cried out to God and I said, you know, God, if what you say in your word is real and you will set me free from all this bondage, if you'll set me free, I'll spend the rest of my life telling people what you've done in my life. And he did. She completed her first year of Bible college while behind bars. After getting out, she finished and even earned a PhD in biblical studies. She sees her release and this new life as a miracle and a reminder of her promise to show inmates there's hope. I had never seen anyone who had come out of my lifestyle who had made it. And I told the Lord, I said, I want to be the one. I want to be the one to do it. And the Florida Department of Corrections is helping her reach women in the same prison where she once served time. She's also working with others like the Potter's House and Pastor Cheryl Brady. But the most surprising partnership developed with the most unexpected person. Never did I dream, you know, in a million years, that four years, five years later, I'd be at a conference and here comes this little lady that I once knew with a bullhorn. And she uh, looks at me and she goes, you don't remember me, do you? She said, you're the lady with the bullhorn. And I said, you're the lady on my corner. Dawn now calls Kathy mom, and together they pray with women on death row. Her rigorous discipleship program has a 98% success rate and a year-long waiting list. Those who make it through feel forever changed. Belinda, for example, recently left for Africa to work with children in Heidi Baker's Christian Missions Group. She credits both God and Dawn for giving her hope and a new identity. I'm so thankful that um, he, he just took somebody like me and like us, all of us, and turned all of our ugliness and all, all of our ugliness, and he made it all beautiful. Dawn's now expanding her ministry to men's prisons with plans to open up discipleship homes for them too. Her passion, however, remains the same, to see revival in the prison nation. I had a lot of people tell me, oh, this is jailhouse religion, and when you leave, you're gonna lose it. It's been nine years, and I'm more on fire and more zealous today than I've ever been. I refuse, you know, to hear that. I'm gonna live for Jesus, and I'm gonna stay on fire. I wanna see revival. John Jessup, CBN News, reporting from Daytona Beach, Florida. What a wonderful story of hope. You can see the fire in her eyes. Here, nine years later, this wasn't a jailhouse conversion. This was a miracle done by God Almighty. I love to remind people, you can never be too dead for a resurrection. <laughs> and keep that in mind, no matter how far you think you've gone, that God doesn't want to have anything more to do with you 
that you've sinned too much, you, you, you're far, so far down in the gutter you can't even see light. God can raise you up, and His promise is true. He lifts you from the ash heap, and He sets you among princes. What a wonderful promise, and that's a promise for you. There is hope for America today, and that hope, His name, is Jesus Christ. Wendy? You can never be too dead for you a resurrection. <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tweet that later. I'll, I'll, give, right. I'll give you credit. I'll give you credit. All right. Well, coming up, Olympic gold medalist diver David Budaya. In 2008, if you would have asked me to sit down with the 700 Club, I would have been like, are you serious? Like, no way. <laughs> so why did David grant us an interview? You'll find out right after this. Be anxious for nothing. That's from Philippians 4, 6. This scripture helped Olympian David, Olympian David Budaya perform the six best dives he's ever done in competition. It also helped him bring home the gold in London in 2012. But four years earlier, his first Olympics was a completely different story. In 2008, if you would have asked me to sit down with the 700 Club, I would have been like, are you serious? Like, no way. Like, you can keep your Jesus and do what you want with that, but I'm over here and I'm going to do my thing for myself. It's crazy to think what God can do to someone who is so obsessed with himself, lay him flat on his face and say, David, you're not going to be the ruler of your life. Just looking back at when I had this dream of wanting to become an Olympian and that pursuit towards that goal, I tried to fill that with whatever I could because I thought ultimately this would bring me happiness and joy. And it was all for David's glory, all for what David wanted. And I didn't worship anyone else besides myself. Everything that I thought of, everything that I pursued was for my own gain. My first Olympic Games, I just realized that it wasn't working. Something, there had to be something else besides this popularity or this pleasure or this desire that I had to be rich and famous that this American dream promised me. There had to be something more than that. And I didn't know where to find that. God changed my heart and it was no longer, look at me, I'm the best. Trying to be a, a visible representation of an invisible God that that's not the David of 2008. God has redeemed me and I've taken control of my life to, to do that for him on a, on a platform that I never thought I would be at. The London Games was not a story I would have written whatsoever. Going into the finals, I was like the most nervous that I had been in a competition since I was 14 years old. And I spoke to a good friend of mine, and he said, David, what is there to be nervous about? And I was like, okay, what are you getting at? And he said, uh, God has already written it. It's already done. What you get to do, what your opportunity is, is to be a vehicle for His glory. And so like instantly, the weight was off of my shoulders. I just think of Philippians 4, 6, it just talks about, be anxious about nothing, but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And that was, that was totally my perspective that next day when I woke up was, was that. My six dives in those finals, um, I was thinking about two things. I had one cue, one thing to think about of, of my takeoff, so making it strong, and the other one, was something my coach Adam Soldati and I kind of made up years before the Olympics and it was 4-6. And it just goes back to Philippians 4-6, that's be anxious about nothing. I knew that I put down six dives, the best that I've ever done in a competition. And I got out of the water and I, I didn't care where I was finishing, whether I was first or fifth. 
Um, I was content and happy because I, I knew I did my best. And I walked over to Adam and uh, he embraced me and hugged me and I looked up and my name was first. One Chinese diver still had to go and he hit the water, my name didn't change and I still couldn't fathom like, so, so my name's first and there's no divers left. What, that means I won? And it was, it's still a surreal moment to think, think back at that, that specific moment. Three months after the Olympics in, in 2012, I got married to my wife, Sunny. And then two years after that, we had our first child, Dakota. And so I get to be dad. I get to be David, the husband. And it's a totally different thing. God has grown me so much in my communication with my wife. First year after the Olympics, it was atrocious. Just me trying to communicate and learn how to navigate marriage. And uh, he's grown me in that so much. And then uh, ultimately trying to, to raise a little girl that fears the Lord. The road to Rio leading up to that, I think God has, has shamed me most at um, really wanting me to be responsible and to pursue excellence. Romans 8, 28 says, God works everything for the good of those who love Him that are called according to His purpose. And that purpose isn't for my happiness and my joy. That purpose is so that I become more like Christ daily. David figured it out. Well, he continues to train for his upcoming competition in Rio on August 20th. And David, we are praying with you and for you. If you want to read more of his story, he's about to release a book on August the 2nd. It's called Greater Than Gold, and you can pre-order it now wherever books are sold. Also, David's hashtag from this story you just saw is hashtag God made me free. And now we'd like to hear how God made you. Just go to our Facebook page and fill in the blank using the hashtag God made me. So give it some thought, then check out our Facebook page and fill in the blank. Love that story. It is a good one. Well, still ahead, a little girl suffers in pain for five long years. It stung. It started right here and it moved down. She was in pain and she was dizzy and she was asking me, Mom, am I going to be okay? Watch how she gets her answer coming up. Well, millions of people have been displaced by the Syrian civil war. Many of them have found safety in countries like Turkey, but now they're trapped in refugee camps and struggling to survive. Before leaving Syria, Hassan and his family lived a comfortable life in a big house on their own farm. Now the whole family lives in one small tent in rural Turkey, and they're struggling to make it. Our home was destroyed in the war, and we had to run for our lives. We came here to escape the fighting and look for work. Finding everyday necessities like water is hard enough. But while we delivered food to the camp, Hassan told us the kids and all the families were terrified of snakes crawling into their tents after dark. We also found out he's severely diabetic and was running low on insulin. I am very sick, but I have to work to feed my family. I work in the fields until I am about to pass out, then eat a sugar cube. Hassan showed us his family's tent and his dwindling supply of insulin. I'm so worried about what my family would do without me that I can't sleep at night. Sometimes I have panic attacks and can't control my breathing. Two days later, we went back to the camp with a fresh supply of insulin for Hassan and a few surprises for all the families. We got a water tank and hooked up a hose for the camp. We also ran electricity to every tent and set up lights. Now that we have lights, we won't have to be afraid of snakes anymore. So we've brought food, water, electricity, and medicine to this little refugee camp. And now, Rahman, our local missionary, is talking to everybody about Jesus Christ. Here in Turkey, CBN is reaching out to those most in need, sharing the love of Christ, and bringing hope for a better future. Thank you so much for the insulin. And with the help you brought to us, we can rest at ease for a while. 
We have been running from the war for a long time. You are the first people who have helped us. Imagine being the first people to help. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're part of that first because a portion of every gift goes into the work of CBN International uh, to not just preach the gospel around the world, but to help people. And you're a part of all of it when you join the 700 Club. If you're not a member, call us now and say, yes, I want to be a part of it. 1-800-759-0700. It's just $20 a month, and that breaks out to 65 cents a day. And when you call with your pledge, I want, want you to have this. It's my father's latest teaching. Uh, it's a wonderful DVD, Victory Through Life's Storms. He takes all of his life experiences, his walk with God, his years in ministry, over 56 years now in ministry. And he says, here are the life's ups and downs. Here's the storms. And you can have victory in the middle of them. And here's what the Bible teaches about it. So if you want it, call us, 1-800-759-0700. And when you call, ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving where the bank does all the work. There's no checks to write. And we send as our gift to you every single month, Power for Life, monthly teaching CDs. So if you like those, ask for Pledge Express when you call. And if you want to designate a gift into the Disaster Relief Fund, uh, there it is, CBN Disaster Relief Fund, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Or you can just go to CBN.com and there's a place on the giving page where you can designate your gift for international disaster relief. We want to reach out to these Syrian refugee camps, uh, whether they're in Jordan or Lebanon or in Europe. Uh, we want to tell them that God loves them. We love them. Uh, we want to bring the gospel to them. We also want to bring what they need, which is food, water, medicine. We want to be there in their time of need. So if you want to be a part of that, just say, I want to give to the Syrian disaster relief when you call. 1-800-759-0700. Wendy? Coming up later, a mother sees her daughter in pain and doctors can do nothing to help. Symptoms started with nausea and shaking and vomiting and dizziness and pain in her stomach. It made me feel sad. I really can't play hard. None of that stuff. See how this child was supernaturally healed. Plus, we'll be praying for you and your needs, so stay with us. Welcome to Washington for this CBN News Break. Police in San Diego say one officer has died and another is expected to survive after both were shot late Thursday night. Authorities say the shooting occurred in a San Diego neighborhood. A suspect is in custody. Police scoured the area for other possible suspects and told neighbors to stay indoors. It wasn't immediately known what led up to the violence. The shooting comes as law enforcement officers are on alert after the killing of police in Dallas and Baton Rouge earlier this month. Well, Operation Blessing is helping fight the Zika virus in Honduras. The International Humanitarian Organization launched a community-based project T uh, rather community-based test project to reduce the number of sites where mosquitoes breed. Mosquito breeding has been especially bad in low-income communities where people don't have the resources to protect themselves. OB Honduras staff and ecologists are trying to introduce mosquito-eating fish and turtles to reduce the risk. If successful, Operation Blessings model can be used around the world to fight devastating mosquito-borne diseases like Zika and malaria. Well, to learn more about Operation Blessing, go to their website, ob.org. Gordon and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Welcome back. For five years, Charity Ivy watched her daughter suffer. Little Sierra was often in too much pain to even play or sleep. Repeated visits to doctors did no good. And then one day, Sierra was instantly healed right in her own home. Sierra Ivy was three years old when her mother Charity noticed blood in Sierra's stool. And then other symptoms started with nausea and shaking and vomiting and dizziness and pain in her stomach. It was day in and day out. It was like an all day thing. She would just come to me out of the blue and say my stomach's hurting. It stung. It started right here and it moved down. 
We started taking her to the doctor, and they couldn't find out what was wrong with her. It was very scary. <laughs> Over the next two years, Sierra's symptoms worsened. Each time Charity took her to the pediatrician, she came home with more questions than answers. I would have to sit with my daughter on the couch and hold her because she was in pain and she was dizzy. And she was asking me, Mom, am I going to be okay? It made me feel sad. I really couldn't go to sleep at night. I really couldn't play hard. None of that stuff. She was asking me why this was happening and what was wrong with her, and I couldn't tell her. Then, when Sierra was five, doctors finally reached a diagnosis. Sierra had a hiatal hernia. They prescribed a medication to help relieve the pain and recommended a strict diet. Neither, however, brought much relief to Sierra. <laughs> Surgery for Sierra was the last option. I knew that I needed an answer from God real soon. I was asking God every day to heal Sierra. When you're praying, you're wondering you what you want it to happen now. <laughs> and doctors are good, but they're not God. <laughs> Charity and her family continued to trust God for Sierra's healing. Then on August 4th, 2015, they were watching the 700 Club. When they get ready to pray, I always call. We're getting ready to pray. We all sat on the couch. I heard Pat say, Somebody else is being healed of a hiatal hernia. The Lord is just touching and healing you right now in Jesus' name. I was really shocked that he said that. I knew it was for her. And I claimed it, and I said, Sierra, claim it in Jesus' name. And I claimed it. I said, God, thank you for healing me. I really thank you. Instantly, Sierra's symptoms subsided. Certain of her daughter's healing, Charity scheduled an upper GI scan. Together, they sat in the doctor's office waiting for the results. I couldn't wait to go and hear what God had done for her. And the doctor just looked at me like nonchalantly and said, she doesn't have a hiatal hernia. I looked at Sierra and I just said, praise God, you're healed. And I just was so happy because he had just healed it like that. I knew it was him because they don't go away on their own. These days, Sierra is a thriving eight-year-old, and Charity could not be happier. Both are thankful that they found their hope in God. Back then, I couldn't even dance hard. I couldn't play hard. And now I can dance hard, play hard. God gives me hope every day. Don't ever lose hope, because God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Nothing on this earth is as amazing as He is. We have to put our faith in Him. We have to wait for Him. It's not our timing, it's His. Oh, I love that story. You know, God had a perfect timing to heal little Sierra. Even though her mom was praying day in and day out, God had a, he had an appointed time, and they happened to be watching the 700 Club at that time. And I love, you know, that Sierra had that well, she is a child, but she had that childlike faith, and we can all have that. That's what it takes to be healed. It's the prayer of faith that heals the sick. And so we want to pray for you today. We're going to do that in just a moment, but first we have some praise reports. Yes, we do. Margaret from Kerrywood, Idaho, was scheduled to go on a work assignment, but went to urgent care instead because she was in severe pain. The doctor treated her for a UTI, but the pain continued for days. Well, Margaret was watching the 700 Club. Wendy said, somebody, the lining of your bladder is really irritated and very painful. You've been crying out to God for relief. He has heard your prayers. He is touching you right now. Just praise him and thank him. Mm -hmm. Margaret and her husband both felt the Holy Spirit fill the room over the next two days. She was completely yeah. Hallelujah. Wow. I what do you that. got? <laughs> All right. Angie from San Bernardino. She suffered from severe headaches since last November. The pain was almost unbearable, so she could not do anything within her house. It became very difficult for her to focus, and she began to lose her memory. Then one day, Angie was watching the 700 Club when she heard you give a word of knowledge, Gordon, saying, there's a woman and your name is Angie. You're praying for your chronic migraines. You heard the report about migraines, and you're saying, please say that, please say that. So 
Angie, you're healed. You're set free in Jesus' name. Immediately, Angie was healed. Her memory has been restored. The pain completely <laughs> gone. Wow. Hallelujah. God knows <laughs> you by name. Just realize that. He knows you by name. He's called you. He's known you since you were in your mother's womb. What a wonderful concept that he's done these things for us, that he died for us, that he set us free from the consequences of sin. He set us free from sin and death. He wants us, he wants us to be in health. He wants us to prosper just as our souls prosper. He wants all of these things for his children. So this is my favorite time of the show. Sierra's mother, Charity, she said, when, wherever we pray, she'd call the kids. So call people in. Let's, let's pray. And if you've got a need in your life, just ask them to lay hands on you. And let's believe God because he wants to honor his word. And here's a scripture for you. When two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. These are the words of Jesus. We can count on them. So let's pray. Wendy and I are going to pray. We're going to agree. You're going to pray. The people with you are going to pray. We're going to lay hands. We're going to touch. And we're going to see that God honors his word for you. Let's pray. Amen. Lord, we just lift the needs of the audience to you right now. And as people are gathering together and they're praying for one another, Wendy and I join with them now, and we join in agreement, and together we say out loud, be healed and be made whole. By the stripes of Jesus Christ, we claim it now that we are healed. In his name, by the sacrifice that he gave, it's not based on anything we do. It's not how much we pray or how good we are or any of that. It's based on how good Jesus is. Mm. So we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We look to him. We look to his sacrifice. We look to his resurrection. We look to him right now. He's at the right hand of the Father, and he ever lives to give intercession for us. And so he right now is joining in this prayer. Thank you, Lord. And when he prays, he gets an answer. Amen. So, Lord, stretch forth your hand to do miracles, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. There's someone you've had recurring problems with acid reflux, and you've damaged your esophagus, and there's like a permanent burning, uh, permanent heartburn, and and you don't know what to do, God's healed it right now in Jesus' name. That burning, that difficulty, it's unusual. It's not at the swallow. It's right before it gets to your stomach. There's just difficulty in things passing through that area. God's mm -hmm. healed you. Thank he you, set Lord. you free from it in Jesus' name. There's someone you're saying, you heard the story about Angie, and you've got a migraine, and you're saying the same thing. Say migraines. And so we're going to say migraines just for you. God's yes. heard your cry. He's answering your prayer now in Jesus' name. Wendy? Yeah, there's a lot of people suffering from this heat wave that's uh, happening all over the country. Some people, it's activating asthma. There's uh, swelling in your legs and arms and hands. And uh, God is just going to create like a supernatural bubble around you. You are not going to be... Um, you know, just right now, just thank him and praise him for relieving this, uh, these symptoms because you're not going to be affected anymore in Jesus' name. Um, there's someone you're s suffering with, uh, a sarcoma is the word I'm getting, and you're in the final stages, mm -hmm. and God has just healed you. And you're going to have energy. You're going to have new life, a new lease on life, and he, you're going to walk out with joy because of what has God has done for you. Just receive it now in Jesus' name. There's someone with a very sore leg, and it's a, it's a circulation issue, and God is touching you right now. That pain is leaving. You're going to feel much better in Jesus' name. Someone with trouble with your pancreas, and it's um, a tumor that's grown in it, and God's going to be able to just supernaturally take it out. And in Jesus' name, be healed 
and, and be retested and realize God's just done a tremendous miracle for you. In Jesus' name, that's leaving you now. You. you just actually felt something move inside your abdomen. God is healing you now in Jesus' name. Thank Lord, you. we thank you. We thank you for the wonderful things that you do. When we receive you, we receive the answer to every human need. Thank you for it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've been healed, we want to share your good report with the world. We want to let others know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So call us, 1-800-759-759. 0700. And if you need prayer, we're here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us. Well, when we come back, we're going to bring it on with your email questions. So don't go away. It's a wonderful offer. It's our Superbook Summer Offer where you get not just one copy of the Bible Explorer, you get three copies plus two bonus episodes. Uh, the Garden of Eden the, in the beginning, and Revelation, all for a gift of $25 when you join the Superbook DVD Club. And let me underline, you also get to stream uh, 26 episodes, uh, two full seasons uh, on any tablet, any smartphone, any internet-connected device. Uh, we've got them all covered now. So uh, you get seasons one and two, all when you join the Superbook DVD Club. So. If you want to, now's the time to get in. 1-800-759-0700. Wendy? Well, before we bring it on, here's a reminder to go to our Facebook page and fill in the blank to this hashtag. God made me blank. You fill in the rest. Just go to Facebook.com slash 700 Club. We look forward to that. All right, Gordon, are you ready? Uh, I am. <laughs> okay, I am. this is an interesting question from <laughs> Ann. He's always ready. All right, how often, do I, ready? <laughs> how often do I need to pray and to praise so I do not lose grace with God? Is it necessary to keep praying, praising morning and night? Also, if I decide to stop praying, praising, and reading the Bible, would I go to hell if I died? I don't want to feel like I must constantly pray, praise, and read my Bible to prove my faithfulness to God because it's become like, severe OCD for me and has taken over my life. Is it enough that I'm in Christ and have been forgiven? Well, uh, I tell you, I, I, just hearing your question, it was exhausting. I, I, would I'm exhausted. I would encourage you to get saved again. Uh, just realize the finished work of the cross. When Jesus said on the cross, it's finished, he meant it. It's not his cross, his death, his sacrifice, his stripes plus your praise, plus your Bible reading? No. He did it all. He did it all. All we have to do is rejoice in it. That's why the Bible talks about, you know, let's not neglect so great a salvation. Uh, here are people coming out from under the law of Moses, where it was all these regulations about what to eat, uh, times to, to do certain things, uh, certain festivals, all of these things, all of these requirements. And now they were finding we're free from that because we're free from the law of sin and death, and we get to live in joy before Him. Our praise, our worship should come from our heart. It should come from a heart full of joy over what He has done for us, the greatness of His power towards us who believe. Let that be your watch. You want to read His Word because you want to hear His voice. You want to praise His name because of what He's done for you. You don't earn salvation. It's a free gift. And take it. <laughs> we leave you these words from Nehemiah. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. God bless you. We'll see you again next week.